room know me, so I don't need to introduce me. <laughs> I'm still me. Uh, and I'm very happy uh, in my function as uh, co-deputy director with Alexander Boskovich of East Central European Center uh, to introduce uh, Professor Franz Lazzo, who is the uh, Istvan Deak Visiting Professor of East Central European Studies at the Hermann Institute for the current uh, spring semester. Uh, in this role, he's teaching two courses in the history department at Columbia. Uh, one is East Central Europe in the 20th century, an intellectual and cultural history, and the other is called the Legacies of Division, East-West Entanglements in Contemporary European History. And uh, I'm not sure if he knows this, but I have moles in each of these courses. These are <laughs> students of mine, uh, and they report that these are excellent courses. Uh, they praise Professor Lazzo for teaching in a way that is intellectually rigorous, uh, but still accessible to those without extensive experience in the discipline or uh, in the study of this region. Uh, his ongoing academic position when he's not with us here in Colombia uh, is as a uh, an universitaire docent uh, at the, in history, of course, at uh, Maastricht University in the Netherlands. Uh, he's also a part-time affiliate of the Central European University's Democracy Institute, where he co-curates uh, the ideas section of the Review of Democracy. Uh, Professor Lazzo is the author or editor of 13 books on Hungarian, Jewish, German, European, and global themes. Uh, his writings have been translated into 15 languages, and his books have been reviewed in more than 50 publications. Uh, he took his PhD in the comparative history of Central, Southeastern, and Eastern European at the Central University, uh, Central European University back in the good old days when the CEU was still based primarily in Budapest. Uh, and I'm uh, very happy uh, to welcome you here to speak about this rather large project. Um, uh, and that's, uh, I think, is going to give us all uh, who work in the broader region of East Central Europe some ideas about uh, what I think is one of the most productive new approaches uh, uh, to, uh, to studying through the lens of global history. Thank you so much for the introduction and, and also for the opportunity to present here today and also for having me as a visiting professor at this term. It's, it's been a great pleasure and really an amazing experience. I wanted to talk to you about a project we have basically just completed. Uh, the second volume, the, the green one, as we call it, came out in November uh, 2023. So we literally launched it a few weeks before I would have uh, flown over. And I, maybe I'll pass them around and then I'll get the, the talk started. So here they are. Obviously, they are in Hungarian, so you may not be able to, uh, to read it fully. But at the same time, I think it shows and quite well, you know, what kind of project it is, but what it looks like if you if you have it also in your own hands. So uh, our recently completed project on the global history of Hungary aims to demonstrate that studying East Central Europe through the systematic application of transnational methods and from a truly global perspective perspective can offer original and valuable insights. East Central Europe has tended to be a semi-peripheral area in the global scheme of things and has thus been much closer to the global average than those parts of the world on which so much of recent global historiography has focused. East Central European countries have also developed numerous and still underexplored intercontinental connections also outside the Western core that should be of special interest in our age of global multipolarity. At the same time, it can be assumed that this diverse area as a rather peripheral part of Europe in a formerly largely Eurocentric world has played the role of a secondary colonialist for significant parts of modern history, a topic that should be researched and critically scrutinized uh, in greater detail than has been done so far, uh, we argue. Moreover, the predominant transnational orientation of this suburb of Europe has shifted repeatedly and sometimes dramatically, creating a complex pattern of legacies or continuities in discontinuity, uh, if you wish, that can only be properly analyzed through a transnational history on the long term. Uh, and our volumes aim to demonstrate uh, this in great uh, detail, actually. 
Now, the two volumes which I have recently co-edited with Andras Vodash and Valint Varga under the title Magyarország Globális Sturtinete, so a global history of Hungary, and that were published uh, in 2022 and in 2023, respectively. These volumes intend to capitalize on these four key insights. And they aim to do so without exaggerating East Central Europe's place and role in global history. They much rather aim to show how is the lives of the diverse people of Hungary have come to be interconnected with and shaped by phenomena originating in practically all the various parts of the globe. Transnational and global trends have exerted a much greater impact on their country's history than the other way around. Now, in today's presentation, I would like to outline our agenda of applying transnational methods to the long term interpretation, or you may say reinterpretation of a country's history. I wish to reflect on our ambition to embed Hungarian history comprehensively in global frameworks. And I shall also discuss then the specific ways in which we have implemented this agenda, uh, not least to explain how the contributing authors, uh, that is 159 uh, scholars in total, have taken up and have also adopted a recent West European approach uh, to historiography. What, some, what were some of the challenges that this has entailed uh, and what opportunities uh, such a process of adaptation offers? But let me begin with a fairly basic uh, description. These two volumes uh, contain uh, 203 chapters uh, in total. They are brief chapters, all of them. And so the two volumes run to about 1,050 uh, pages in total. Uh, numerous historians, but also geologists, archaeologists, linguists, scholars of literature, historians of art and architecture, uh, scholars of religion, anthropologists, economists, political scientists, scholars of international relations, sociologists, and media studies scholars have contributed chapters of about five to seven uh, pages each. Okay, that was the longest sentence. <laughs> <laughs> the resulting volumes uh, cover historical developments from what the subtitle of volume one calls the very beginnings, a okay, case detector. Uh, in this case, the formation of the Pannonian Plain, uh, an area that largely coincides with the current territory uh, of the Hungarian state, and it was formed about a million and a half years ago. And we take the story all the way to 2022 uh, and the recent global pandemic. The, the last mm -hmm. chapter is about, about the COVID uh, pandemic. The narrative we developed as stretches from geological matters and questions concerning the early spread of human settlement and agriculture through the emergence of world religions and the era of European colonialism and imperialism, all the way to issues, uh, some of the key issues, I would say, uh, in the multipolar and contested globalization of today. And this narrative arc already suggests, we believe, uh, why such a global history may be needed uh, in the more peripheral parts of Europe, uh, such as Hungary, where more substantial and critical discussions concerning the country's place and role in the global scheme of things are arguably only beginning. Uh, and also given the current uh, right-wing hegemony uh, in the country, these discussions, I would say, promise to be rather contentious. Now, as you will know, uh, transnational and global histories explore connections across borders and between continents. And as a number of recent examples show, the preferred methods and thematic priorities of these approaches can actually be usefully deployed to reconceptualize the history of particular places. So combining approach and theme in this way can bring greater attention to and help us develop new interpretations of aspects of a country's history that may have received rather limited attention until now, uh, but should now be viewed as particularly important in a much more interconnected world. So such a combination of approach, right, transnational and global history and uh, subject, that is the history of Hungary, allows scholars to challenge in a very detailed, in a very detailed and empirical manner prevalent uh, perceptions concerning what we call the supposed internal logics of national history, right? These are, of course, logics that have been depicted uh, in a detailed and, and really thorough professional manner 
in many mainstream works of Hungarian national historiography, uh, such as, again, perhaps most famously uh, when it comes to recent decades, those that were penned by Ignaz Romsic. To use an analogy uh, to, to try to explain what I mean, according to the internalist perspective uh, to which we aim to develop an alternative here, uh, the main actors in history, also called nations, behave much like billiard balls. Uh, they hit and may bounce off each other, but remain solid uh, in the process. Mm -hmm. And unlike in the actual games we play, our main concern should actually be what, with what is happening inside those uh, billiard balls. Right now, our project uh, much rather was much rather interested in Hungary's uh, diverse integration into the world, whereby the term "world" can refer to uh, its immediate neighbors or nearby areas, uh, to uh, uh, to Europe uh, and Eurasia, uh, to religions, perhaps uh, Christianity, especially, but certainly not exclusively. Uh, to the semi-peripheral areas uh, that exist on various continents, uh, but also to the entire planet uh, with all its continents and oceans. So what a global history of Hungary thus offers uh, may be compared to an impressionist painting. Objects and actors are depicted in a somewhat unusual manner. Their contours appear less sharp, yet they remain easily recognizable. And hopefully it all amounts to a colorful, uh, enjoyable, and thought-provoking experience for the reader. So in other words, our ambition has not been to deconstruct the national narratives as such. It has rather been to substantially enrich such narratives and reconceptualize them for an age of manifold uh, interconnectedness. Or to put it differently, the words Hungary and global are actually equally significant parts of our title. And ultimately, we believe that it is their juxtaposition and extensive interweaving on these pages uh, that may give this project some uh, public relevance today. Or to try and make this very same point through the categories of political thought, this juxtaposition and this interweaving means that our volumes consistently approach Hungarians as constituting a political rather than an ethnic nation. And we narrate Hungarian history in a way that consciously takes into account the often underemphasized uh, diversity of the country's inhabitants across the centuries, rather than trying to foreground unifying features to then arrive at a vision of something like a common national purpose or, or a vision of maybe even national homogeneity. I should also say that these recently published volumes in the Hungarian language are themselves integral parts of a transnational wave of scholarship, uh, building on decades of dedicated research and also growing interest in global history. The specific wave I am referring to started in France back in 2017 with the publication uh, to great acclaim and also amid some fierce uh, polemics, I, sh I should say, of a volume titled Histoire mondiale de la France which has subsequently then appeared also in English a translation as France in the World, a New Global History. That's the English title. And our volumes on the global history of Hungary may in fact be qualified as the 10th project uh, of this kind, following the French, the Italian, the German, the Dutch, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Catalan, the Flemish, and the Sicilian. Wow. They all employ the same template of writing history, which was originally developed by Patrick Bouchon and his colleagues in Paris, uh, such as Pierre Sandra Ravelou, uh, who, by the way, will speak at uh, Columbia University uh, later this week, uh, presenting his new large-scale project on our colonizations. It's a French uh, book on, on, on the history of French uh, colonialism and colonial history, and he'll be speaking about that on Friday. And now I should maybe add just as a quick side note that when we were editing the first volume, uh, we actually believed that we were doing the sixth uh, <laughs> book. And as we were writing uh, our introduction to it, we realized that there were another four we had to bear off. And you know, those people obviously got ahead and, 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 and went on to, to publish their books uh, before, before we did uh, in 2022. So what are some of the basic features of this approach? Um, and which are some of the concrete paths that our authors have taken to implement this overarching uh, concept? Now, individual chapters in all these projects begin by describing a concrete event, 
connected to a specific year, an event which is seen as illustrative of a larger transnational trend developing over a more extended uh, period. And it is this larger trend that is then discussed and analyzed in a concise manner in the rest of each chapter, right? So basically, have a main title, which refers to a year and an event, and then a subtitle which specifies the larger subject of why, why this event is so important to, to use as an entry point into a larger, larger theme, into a larger question. So to take just a few examples from the volumes uh, on, on Hungary, one of the contributions by Robert Bolog uh, introduces the story of the first black locust plant uh, that was planted in Pest, that's in 1789, to consider larger questions of scientific knowledge transfer and also ecological colonization, right? This is what is commonly known as the uh, Okats in Hungary or Acacia, mm -hmm. right? And Hungary happens to have the largest percent of its territory planted with Acacia today, right? It's a world leading <laughs> country in this particular respect, a quite a rare instance. Uh, and so of course, for this reason, uh, it's, it's quite an important subject that it's actually something that arrives only in the very late 18th century. Right, and it's of course not indigenous in any way to, uh, to Europe. Uh, the chapter contribution by Shandor Reves uh, discusses the foundation of the Esperanto Society in Hungary in 1901 to then reflect on the search for a common a universal language in modern times. Uh, you will most probably know that, of course, Esperanto comes from Poland, uh, but the major Esperanto journal uh, in the interval period was actually published in Hungary. So it's, it's a very uh, important subject for that reason as well. Now, the 1941 publication of the famed and again very widely read of Ilagirodom Története, that's a history of world literature by Antal Serb, uh, in turn provides our author, our contributing author, Esther Palfi, uh, with an opportunity to discuss the transformation of European and also global literary canons and how Serb's uh, specific interpretations relate to those, to those canons. While uh, state socialist Hungary's agreement with the International Monetary Fund, that is the IMF, uh, in 1982, allows uh, Andras Pinkas uh, to analyze the rise of global finance in contemporary times uh, with a focus on the connections to and the consequences for the country uh, and its regime, that is to say the Kadar regime of the, of the 80s. This approach uh, first used to reinterpret the history of France in a global context has not only offered us an attractive template uh, that could be adopted to reconceptualize Hungarian history, but our discovery of it, which actually happened via the Dutch, the Flemish, and the German adaptations, I was aware of the Dutch book because some of my colleagues in Maastricht contributed to it. Uh, our discovery of these books encouraged us to launch our endeavor in the first place. Uh, and our becoming aware of this way of writing history, in fact, made us realize the very feasibility of such a large scale global history of Hungary. Uh, and it also revealed to us something that we had not expected at all, uh, that it might be possible to employ some of the latest methods in transnational historiography and at the same time reach a wide audience uh, in Hungary, right? These are, of course, books that sold uh, really well practically in every <laughs> country where there was such a project and also in Hungary we actually made uh, serious money on these books which is a very strange experience for somebody who works at the university. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I ought to mention uh, that we find it somewhat surprising uh, that this approach to writing global history seemed not to have found uh, adopters outside Europe yet uh, even though I would say the history of a host of countries including India, Brazil, uh, Australia, not to mention the United States of course it would certainly provide exciting and eminently suitable subjects. Um, now, as co-editors, we considered and also <laughs> very much re reconsidered and kept on reconsidering uh, which subjects individual chapters should analyze, uh, what should be the desirable proportions between them, uh, how to think about the list of potential contributors, and then already together with the respective authors, uh, we were thinking about the specific developments or the, or the specific events uh, that were to serve as the entry point uh, into the larger themes. I should perhaps say that we always suggested the larger theme, uh, which we, we tended to insist on in almost all cases. And then we also suggested an event uh, connected to a specific year, uh, which could serve as an entry point, but that was negotiable. 
So if an author said, yes, I'm happy to write about de-democratization uh, at this point, at this point, but I think this is much more important than what you're suggesting, we were very happy to change uh, the year and therefore also to change the place of the of the chapter in, in the book, because that in the end was, was up to the up to the contributing authors uh, to uh, decide. And so we came to agree that uh, nine overarching themes uh, sh 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 should be covered in these volumes, and we set them as follows. So number one, transnational economic trends and the making of world economies, political ideas, political rule, and regime types, war and violence, that's number three, migration, very important topic throughout, cultures and religions, colonialism, racism, and questions of decolonization, everyday life and consumption, environment and diseases, that's number eight, slightly strange category, but <laughs> that's how it fit. And then last but not least, stigmatized and marginalized groups. So we wanted to look at the transnational history of such groups, LGBT, also Roma community, and, 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 and so on. So as these nine large themes keep on recurring as the reader moves along the centuries, the chapters get interwoven in intricate and hopefully suggestive ways. So having agreed on these main themes, these nine large themes, uh, the task was then to formulate uh, more specific research questions uh, for each of these areas. And so, for example, economic innovations uh, and crises were chosen as the central themes of the chapters concerned with the modern economy. So this then generated research questions such as how did various economic innovations arrive in and impact the Hungarian economy? And how did the country compare to others in this respect? Or how was Hungary's economy impacted by the various major economic crises and why? Or more specifically, how can we account for the particularly negative consequences of, by global comparison that several of those slums came to exert on the country, right? We know that Hungary was one of the worst hit by the economic crisis of 1873, of 1929, and also of 2008-9, right? Even in global comparison, is one of the countries that was always really, really badly hit. I mean, this is, of course, something quite, quite interesting and quite important. But let me take another example. So trends of democratization and de-democratization, again, in transnational and global perspective, of course, have been placed at the heart of chapters on the types of political rule in modern and contemporary times. And then this led to research questions such as, how can the processes of democratization and de-democratization in Hungary be embedded in relevant global trends? And how have they been shaped by various transnational influences? But also, what might account for Hungary's specific place and role in those trends at various times? Right. So these were some of the main research questions concerning the economy and the, and the politics related parts. And this in turn, of course, then helped us determine uh, what should be the subjects of the individual chapters, right? So as I mentioned, there are separate chapters devoted to the impacts of the 1873, the 1929, and the 2008-9 economic crisis in the same way that we have chapters on the fight for women's right to vote, uh, the right-wing authoritarian power grab uh, in 1919, right, by, by Miklos Horty and, and members of, of the National Army. Uh, we have, of course, a chapter on the revolutionary, or you may call it revolutionary, changes of 1989. Uh, and we also have a chapter on current trends of de-democratization, and all of these are explored uh, from, a, from a broad a global perspective. So this was this was the basic the basic scheme. Now this resulted in chapters of four kinds, and this we wanted to, to you know do very uh, consciously that there should be chapters um, that focus on what we call local national manifestation of global events and trends, as well as the interconnections between transformation on the local or national and on the larger more global scales. So let me give you some examples. Uh, maybe the most obvious are the world wars, uh, landscape and climate change, very obvious as well, but then also more specific subjects, Gothic architecture, uh, the Renaissance, the rise of universities, uh, witch hunts, uh, or the opening of the stock market uh, in, in Pest. Some other chapters, that's chapter type number two, and uh, uh, these chapters primarily aim to reconceptualize cases that have often been studied on the local, national, 
or at most the regional level through transnational methods and through broader contextualization. Uh, so what are uh, some of the examples? The foundation of a Christian state, right? Hungary was founded uh, as a Christian state in 1000. The spread of the idea of religious uh, freedom in the 16th century, right? Where, well, <laughs> there is a strong narrative that Hungary was, or well, Transylvania, in fact, was among the first to uh, uh, to institute uh, religious freedom uh, uh, through, the, through, the, through the diets there. We also have the chapter on the uh, attempts to, to protect minority, popula minor, minority uh, populations in the 20th century, right? Another massive theme. And we wanted to show how attempts to protect especially Hungarian minorities across the borders, as it's often said, relate to the global history of minority protection regimes, right? Um, we also have a chapter on the introduction of neoliberal austerity uh, measures uh, in more recent decades which again, in the case of Hungary we're dealing with, is primarily identified uh, with the so-called Bokros package, named after the, the finance minister of the time that was introduced back in 1995. So that's chapter type number two. Uh, a third type uh, explores the appearance and impact of people and phenomena on Hungary that actually clearly originated on other continents, right? So what are some of the relevant examples? Well, pandemics, <laughs> clearly enough. Uh, the Pax Mongolica, right? Hungary was, of course, uh, shortly, but but in a very uh, devastating way, was part of, of, of the, the, the Mongolian realm. Uh, the spread of pepper and uh, coffee, right? It's also, of course, partly on the cover because pepper is so strongly identified mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as an unavoidable part of any Hungarian dish. But of course, as we all know, it comes from uh, the area that's today's uh, Mexico. Uh, now, we also have a chapter on the early reception of democracy uh, in America. You may know that there was a Hungarian traveler who was traveling at the same time as Stockville, and in fact, even met him and wrote about uh, uh, well, the US uh, at, at that time um, and questions of democracy. Well, he's not nearly as famous as Stockville, obviously, uh, and he's not probably not nearly as insightful either, but it's a very good, it's a very good case study uh, for, for a transnational uh, perspective also on, also on this subject. We have a chapter on the reception of Latin American cultures uh, during the Cold War. Uh, we have chapters on religions that originated uh, in India, uh, actually several, because of course we have Buddhism and also uh, Hare Krishna, uh, uh, so, so which is of course connected to Hinduism. Um, and also we have chapters on the, on the recent and ongoing investments by companies from East Asia, right? Uh, of course, Hungary produces uh, Japanese <laughs> cars and, and Korean uh, products, and of course, uh, Huawei, so the, the, one of the major Chinese companies has a, has a major base uh, in Hungary as well uh, in the early 21st century. So those are very important uh, uh, subjects as we come into the contemporary era. So that's chapter type number three. And then fourth, some of the chapters foreground the diverse activities that Hungarians have pursued in various parts of the world. And examples that might be worth mentioning here are the scholarly insights that were sort of the byproducts of the search for an ancient homeland of the Hungarians, such as, curiously enough, the first dictionary between English and Tibetan, right? There's a person <laughs> who's looking for, you know, how, where does the Hungarian language come from? And he ends up developing a dictionary between Tibetan and English because some person, uh, well, basically uh, mislead him uh, into, into believing that, that it might be connected to, to what's being spoken uh, in Tibet. Now, the spread of uh, Hussar regiments is another such subject, right? So via France and, 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 and of course, onto a number of other countries. Orientalist paintings in the 19th century, some of the leading Orientalist painters of the time were, were from Hungary. Uh, attempts to discover the heart of Africa, right? That's actually one of the chapters I personally have uh, contributed, uh, right? There's a, a Hungarian person who tries to go up the Congo River in 1848. Uh, uh, and of course, well, uh, because of Belgian and the very close connection uh, of the Belgian royal family to the Habsburgs, uh, the story is, of course, extremely important. Uh, in fact, uh, Habsburg. Uh, People were very, very closely involved, uh, not only the British, who are who are much more famous, probably. Um, scientific research in the US would be another good example here, uh, perhaps again, most most famously uh, research that then leads to the development of the atomic bomb via the Manhattan Project. Um, several Hungarians uh, there. Uh, engineering uh, in the global south after the end of West European empires, such as independent Algeria, you may know the major football stadium. Uh, in Algiers uh, is a copy of a stadium that was in Budapest, but that they demolished 
<laughs> in recent years, which was the main uh, stadium of, of the country beforehand. Uh, and also things like the Hungarians' uh, role uh, in the war on terror, right? There was a part of Afghanistan uh, which was under Hungarian command, and also things like the business of prostitution, right? It's a very famous subject in, in Europe uh, today that in, in several countries such as Switzerland or also the Netherlands, uh, many of the prostitutes uh, come, from, come from Hungary and uh, also neighboring uh, countries. Now, it has been evident to us from the very beginning that uh, this list of subjects cannot be exhaustive, right? Uh, our choices should certainly not be seen as exclusive. In fact, whenever we present uh, this book in Hungary, people always come up to us to tell us why we haven't included X, Y, Z, and so, <laughs> and how that's the most important and so. And we always say, yeah, that's that's a very, very good point. If there was a third volume, which I don't think there's gonna be, that would definitely be in there. But in fact, we also wanted to, uh, to uh, finish the first book with 99 chapters and then do a competition that the hundredth chapter uh, can be submitted by the reader. We haven't organized it yet, but but maybe maybe in the future. So uh, so it would be quite justified also, I would say, to object uh, that key terms such as Hungary or global or transnational. These of course sound quite anachronistic uh, when you apply them to past centuries and past uh, millennia. Uh, admittedly, nobody had a sense of all continents prior to the 17th century. That's that's clear, right? Except for certain parts of Asia and Africa, Europeans didn't know uh, the world at all <laughs> the way we understand it today. And European maps actually started adding the continents known to us today uh, in the early modern uh, period. And this is a process we, of course, study in a separate chapter uh, in volume one. However, we argue that historians may still apply the term global uh, to describe the widest relevant contexts of historical processes uh, in previous epochs, or to try and consider all the territories that were known to the various historical actors, right? So this is, this is the idea. It's not global in the contemporary sense, but global in a contextual sense. Now, of course, the term uh, Magyar Orsag or Hungary is admittedly even less justifiable when it comes to centuries, especially prior to the 10th century of the common era, uh, not to mention the undeniable uh, complication that the dominant mode of counting centuries and counting years, which we of course employ also in these volumes is connected uh, to the history of Christianity, uh, even in its secularized form, even if you say, uh, uh, you know, common era or so. Now, after extended discussions, uh, we decided to include several chapters at the very beginning of volume one, in which Hungary and Hungarians play no role at all, uh, such as geological processes that I mentioned uh, that formed the territory where the Hungarian state in its various manifestations came to be situated much, much later, right, a million and a half years uh, later, uh, or how the natural vegetation uh, of this area had been completely transformed by the time uh, the Magyars and other settlers actually arrived uh, in this place. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the chapter on, on, on this uh, issue, the, the natural vegetation, shows, which was a big surprise to me, I must admit, that the Roman Empire had a much greater impact or in this respect than the Hungarian state for the first more than 700 years of its existence. So until the 18th century, the Hungarian state did not nearly uh, transform the natural vegetation as much as the Romans did uh, more than a thousand years uh, before that. And now at the same time, volume one also contains chapters on the arrival of the Hungarians uh, in, in the Pannonian uh, Basin and the foundation of the Hungarian uh, kingdom However, the basic intention behind those chapters was rather to relativize the importance of these events, which tend to appear as crucial or, or even as decisive moments in more conventional and national narratives. We have a whole host of chapters on you know, migration to Hungary, one after the other, uh, including you know, Romanians, uh, uh, Saxons, uh, Jews, uh, Muslims, and so on. And well, the Hungarians, in a way, appear as one of those uh, groups. Uh, and we wish to do so not least because the diversity of cultural and religious identities and also political statuses uh, continue to have a much more powerful impact uh, beyond those dates, that is to say in the 10th century or around 1000, than the sense of belonging to a country. Uh, not to speak uh, of belonging to something like a unified or a homogeneous nation, which are essentially modern ideas, uh, of course.
Now, this transnational wave in historiography that I already alluded to earlier has unfolded primarily uh, in Western Europe until now, right? We had books in, in, uh, in France, Italy, Spain, uh, the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, and so on, right? This book uh, can, in fact, be qualified as the first adaptation of this new uh, popular way of writing global history to a case in East Central Europe. So in other words, we have adopted an approach that was originally developed in France and that was originally developed to interpret French history to the admittedly rather different case of Hungary. And this has, of course, raised some special challenges. Uh, and it has perhaps also enabled uh, our contributors uh, to develop some innovative aspects of this transnational wave in a slightly new uh, direction. So what were some of the key challenges that we faced uh, in preparing these two uh, rather large uh, volumes with such a global horizon? I mean, the first first thing to mention should be uh, the, the rather weak institutionalization of transnational and global historiography within the country, right, within Hungary, uh, but also the fact that intra-regional or intra-European references may have been much more directly relevant to some of the actors we study, and therefore also much more evident in the historical record. So if that is the case, and that is actually often the case, and then a proper global contextualization often requires also original comparative analysis. So let me give you an example, which I actually is my favorite example. Hungarian feminists, they actively participated in a significant trans transnational wave of activism prior to the First World War, right? Uh, this, the seventh conference of the International Women's Suffrage Alliance was held in Budapest in 1913, just before the First World War. And these uh, feminists who organized it were very, very closely connected and also is connected to and inspired by uh, German and British uh, uh, trends or German and, and British uh, feminists in particular, right? And you see that in the sources uh, immediately. It's very, very obvious. Now, you don't really see the rest of the world uh, in those sources related to these Hungarian actors. So what you then need uh, is to think about the structural position of these people and some of their main concerns. And then you may realize uh, that those made them relatively similar uh, to their counterparts in Argentina or maybe Egypt and so on, right? So this is something where, again, the comparative method can be really useful. So first you do uh, transnational history via your primary sources, and then, and then you go beyond that by doing comparisons via the secondary literature. This is basically what the chapter we have in this second volume on this subject does. Uh, and I think this is a very good example, right, of how even if the topic itself seems very Eurocentric in a certain way, you can actually do more than that. Now, the just mentioned key challenges were practically the flip side uh, of what we perceived as our major opportunity, uh, well, on the very in a very basic sense, uh, to produce a fresh and in many ways original interpretation of Hungarian history through the consistent use of this method and through the application of broader uh, perspectives. So what, what this has resulted in, I would argue, uh, is that authors depict Hungary on these pages as a country with multifaceted and substantial transnational connections, whose history and society have gradually come to be intertwined with phenomena from all the diverse parts of the globe. Our volumes insist that Hungary is an East Central European country, which has in many ways been peripheral within Europe, and you could say semi-peripheral globally, even if to varying degrees and in various ways across time, and I'll say more about that in a second. And it has also been a state that has tended to define its place in the world as a European state, and which has thus also had numerous links to the processes of colonization and decolonization in recent centuries, often as a kind of secondary uh, colonialist, that is to say through economic networks, through cultural representations, through racialized uh, imagery, or, to, or through uh, downright uh, racist uh, practices. So what the volumes ultimately seek to do is to offer a kind of fine balance between regional, continental, and global forms of contextualization through which we were meant to relativize, but not to ignore the role of Eurocentrism, right? Actually, our introduction states 
that the European horizon of Hungarian history may in fact appear more prominently in these volumes than on the pages of several of their West European counterparts, such as, such as the French, just as the marked emphasis on the global connections of Hungarian history may strike many of our readers as more original or even as surprising. So what we thereby aimed to foster was to, was to really have some critical reflections on Eurocentric perspectives that to, to our minds have shaped a, so much of Hungarian culture and politics in recent centuries, you may say. Now, uh, because of all these reasons, we hope that, that this will be perceived as an original and rather creative adaptation of the approach developed by Bouchon and his colleagues uh, in France uh, originally, not least because what we clearly show, and I said this earlier, of course, is that transnational and global trends have exerted a much greater impact on Hungary than the other way around. The French volume, I should, I should note, has in fact been critiqued for perhaps being too inspired by ideas of Francophonie and too vested in showing the French footprint uh, in the history of the world, right? This is one of the, one of the angles from which uh, the French book was, was critiqued. And that aspect of the French project, and again, we could discuss whether this criticism was fair or not, and to what extent it applied. That's, that's not, not uh, so important, uh, maybe, maybe for the moment. Uh, but, but that aspect actually um, reminded us of a popular trend uh, in the writing of world history in Hungary that we actually consciously reject and that we consciously try to critique throughout these pages, uh, which is a tradition in popular scholarship that massively exaggerates at the place and role of Hungary and Hungarians in the history of the world. Right? You may know there's a famous book, how uh, the Scottish people invented the modern world and everything in it. Right? Of course, there are such books in every country and in every language, and they, they have been some of the, the, the they have been some of the bestsellers uh, in the kind of in the kind of realm into which we're stepping in. You know, people will be buying our book who have maybe read such books before, we think, and, and actually there are quite some evidence that, that that is the case. We very often have to explain that the point is not to say that that, that somehow the world was made by Hungarians and so on, because that's, of course, what you can read uh, in, in a lot of in a lot of media as well. So again, of course, we didn't want to, to foster some kind of undue uh, pride or, or, or maybe even vanity in this way. So, and we also think that this statement, so the, the very basic statement that transnational and global trends have exerted a much greater impact on the country than the other way around, actually doesn't require too much extra justification, right? It's, it's a country <laughs> whose current territory was a part of the frontier region of the Roman Empire, right? Um, it was a state that was founded on the outmost uh, fringes of Latin uh, Christendom and also partly in a zone of transition to Byzantium, right? I mean, of course, Hungary had very strong connections to Byzantium uh, early on. Uh, it's, it's an area that in the early modern period was simultaneously on the periphery of the Ottoman Empire and of what you might call European Christian world. I think this is an expression that makes sense for the, for the early modern times, actually. And uh, it was, of course, also on the western edges of the Soviet realm of the Soviet Empire in, the, in much of the for, for much of the 20th century. And of course, Hungary has never really belonged uh, to the dynamic core regions of the world economy. That's also quite clear. As I said earlier, it's rather a country that's closer to the to the global uh, average in, in quite a number of respects. And it may even be considered a rather poorly integrated uh, member state of the European <laughs> Union in our own uh, time, uh, if, if you want to talk about that. Now, uh, I should add that the intention behind this A Global History of Hungary project was certainly not to offer some kind of teleological story, by the way. So, so you know, you could, of course, write a history where there's a continuous deepening of connections, countries get, get to be uh, globally embedded ever more uh, across the centuries and so on. Of course, there are numerous cases that we analyze where we show that transnational connections started to matter more and more, and that the scale of phenomena expanded beyond Europe and beyond Eurasia and so on and so forth. There's, there are lots of examples of that. But we also demonstrate that uh, the history of the country was similarly characterized by major shifts in its predominant uh, transnational relations, such as via Christianization, right, which was a major transnational shift. Uh, the process of Sovietization would be another example, of course, and also the Ottoman conquest, maybe, maybe most uh, famously. Now, 
Moreover, we also have specific chapters which show uh, that, that there were contrary trends, right? We have, for example, a chapter on the Armenians, an Armenian diaspora which arrives uh, in Hungary and is a global is part of a global diaspora at first, and then gradually they become nationalized, right? So in fact, in fact, it's the, it's the opposite kind of development. Or we also have a chapter about universities and how they decline. Uh, in Hungary, right? That's, of course, something that that's five, six hundred uh, years ago now. Uh, but of course, in that sense, Hungary actually also becomes less part of a very, very important transnational uh, trend at the time. So what the two volumes reveal is rather that the basic tendencies of various epochs have markedly differed from one another. And again, let me take just the most obvious example. We show, I think, quite, uh, quite persuasively that medieval Hungary may be classified as a place where many of the newest trends in Europe and also in Eurasia played out in parallel and may also have been combined with each other, which I think makes it in the country really quite interesting, also from an from a, uh, international uh, point of view. Whereas in early modern times, the country experienced a stark process of peripheralization, right, within Europe and also within the Ottoman Empire, to which large parts of it uh, came, to, came to belong. But remarkably enough, this peripheralization coincided with a multifaceted global opening, right? I'll, I'll just give you one example, which actually uh, the media uh, picked up on and, and, and entitled the number of our uh, interviews uh, uh, along these lines. You know, Ottoman subjects were drinking coffee uh, imported uh, from Arabia, of course, and, and, and from before that from Ethiopia, uh, from Chinese porcelain uh, cups uh, mm -hmm. in the Buddha castle around the very same time that silver was sent to Spain from Latin America to finance the Catholic armies to try to liberate uh, Buddha and to liberate this, uh, this uh, Ottoman uh, province, right? So that's, that's what you have in the early modern times. So in that sense, what we ultimately propose is that the study of such complex patterns may actually offer original and valuable insights into global history as such, perhaps. And it also suggests that grasping the nuances of these very intricate patterns uh, may help us think about the often contradictory tendencies of our own age. So thank you so much uh, for your attention. Thank you so much for this talk, which I think uh, really delivered on its uh, uh, its promise to uh, uh, help all of us into this enormous project. And I, I have to say my students were right that you are really good at uh, doing things with intellectual rigor, but making them accessible to those of us who are kind of amateurs and at least part of what you do. Uh, I'll, I'll take my prerogative at the head of the table to pose two questions and then open it to the floor. Uh, the first is that uh, you, you hinted at how uh, the, the approach you're taking uh, is going to invite some criticism from people who take a different view of history. And I wonder if you could just give us a little glimpse of uh, what are some of the substantial terms and maybe what are some of the petty terms on which, on which uh, this project has been criticized. Uh, and my second question is, um, uh, I'm so excited about this. It seems like it's just something we should all be doing in all parts of East Central Europe. And do you know who's next? Or is, will it be the Poles? Will it be the Bulgarians? Will it be the Czechs? I uh, would love to know. Great, great. Fantastic question. Thanks so much. So I would say, um, you know, we went to the first launch and it's my colleague, my co-editor, Bani Dvarga, who said this, uh, that the national histories with what we call the internal logic, they have been written for something like 200 years. Okay. There's five or six waves uh, of national history writing that uh, historians of historiography talk about. And we are the first ones to do something quite, really quite different, something that is, that is a serious alternative. And what Barry Varga said is that, of course, we don't claim that this is the complete story and these are the only things that matter. Actually, what we would prefer is to have the two approaches somewhat combined. Because there is one uh, example which I think is very suggestive here. You know, Ho Chi Minh, uh, the, the Vietnamese leader, appears uh, in these volumes more often than people like Istvan Betlen or Istvan Kisa, you know, who were you know, prime ministers of, of Hungary for a decade or 15 years or what have you in, in, in modern times and who are obviously like uh, discussed uh, uh, extensively uh, across, across uh, historiography. And 
Well, we basically say, well, for this volume, for this perspective, for this approach, having Ho Chi Minh uh, mentioned much more often than, than Istvan Betlen actually makes sense. That doesn't mean that that's kind of realistic about the history of the country as such. But we are providing an alternative, and we wish that the two things would be would be intertwined more in the future, right? That this kind of self-centered, narrow perspective would, would actually start to incorporate some of the very significant dimensions of history that we that we flesh out here that by connecting uh, the country uh, systematically through the to the to the rest of the world. So that's kind of I think the substantial part. Now, Patty, I should say this is I think very interesting. We got a lot of uh, reviews. I think twenty or more of the first volume by now, and also there were reviews in various languages, which really surprised us. We have French language review in Paris. We have Czech. We have uh, uh, English language review in Germany. We even have a Croatian one now, short, short discussion, and so on. Uh, in Hungary, there was a lot of interest. We sold a lot of copies. We gave a lot of interviews also for, for media uh, that, are, that are quite widely read or listened to, but we didn't get really attacked yet. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, of course, uh, it's also an interesting question. We had, we had one very negative review in a kind of, let's say, conservative uh, journal, which more or less accused us of being... Uh, uh, part of the Soros network and things well, like I that. I would hope so. <laughs> yes, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, too original, to be honest. But but uh, uh, the, 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 the point is that I think partly because we have so many historians who have contributed to it, basically, I would say um, a very large percent of the professional historians are in here. And we didn't select them at all on a political basis, to be honest, right? I mean, I know more or less with many of my colleagues, whether they're liberals, left-leaning or conservative or this or that, but it really didn't matter. This is not why we picked them or didn't. And it was more uh, affinity with, with the project, uh, with the approach and, and so. And so therefore, I think for, for the regime kind of controlled media, which is in a way most of the, the media in the country, I think it was not worth uh, trying to trying to to uh, attack it also because it's a difficult book to attack because you have to know quite a lot to do a good <laughs> job at it you can't just you can't just like you know so anyway so that's the that's the the, the the first the second one who's next now that is very very interesting right when we started out uh, I should maybe say so my my uh, Dutch colleagues uh, in Maastricht contributed uh, several chapters to the uh, to the Dutch volume right uh, it's called the world history of the Netherlands and also, there's of course a Flemish volume that I mentioned, right? Verdelt uh, Cassini is from Flanderen, and and that is very interesting because of course Maastricht is right next to, uh, and many of my colleagues are not Dutch but Belgians. Mm -hmm. So for 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 Maastricht, for for the specific locale, it was extremely interesting to have both of those projects run in parallel, and what the Flemish would do and what the Dutch would do and how they would write, because in many ways it's an integrated uh, area in in terms of scholarship uh, today, right? But still, there is there is an attempt to do. Right. It's, it's also extremely interesting for the reason uh, that, you know, this project can take on very different uh, colors. So ours is, I would say, a, a project that is in many ways uh, criticizing nationalism. Mm -hmm. But, for example, the Catalan project is not like that at all. It's a Catalan nationalist project because they want to say Catalonia is not Spain. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and we have a global history of our own and we are connected to the rest of the world. But, but Spain doesn't really matter that much in that book. Right. That's very, very clear. That they're the sort of the, the political uh, impetus or, or the political subtext is very different. Uh, so that's how it started. But I must say, I, I suggested the project to Balint Varga, the co editor uh, uh, of the first uh, volume, when we saw that the German volume came out. That was 2020. I wrote to him, Look, Balint, even the Germans are doing this now. So if you're not you know, making a move now, <laughs> you know, somebody else will do it, right? So it's coming our way. You know, the, the madness cannot be stopped anymore. <laughs> and so, so basically, uh, uh, that was our time. And I have to say, I haven't heard of anything very serious. I have Romanian colleagues from Bucharest who have contacted me and we discussed at length uh, how they could do it, what was our experience and so on. And they were considering it. But to be honest, I don't think they have started it yet. I don't know where, where the polls fit into this because they could, of course, do it. The Habsburg realm would be a fantastic subject for this, even though probably as difficult as Europe as a whole, if not more difficult. <laughs> OK, just kidding. But, uh, but also Transylvania, for example, right? So we had a we had a clear idea that this would be extremely useful for a region like Transylvania. And in fact, we had a lot of support from Transylvanians. We got lots of interviews and we got a lot of our articles re republished in one of the, the major uh, media sites uh, over there, like one of the independent sites. 
Uh, and actually, we did a panel. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm answering too long, but these are all, of course, layers <laughs> to the story. We had a panel last summer with the French, the German, and the Dutch editors. Uh, and we wanted to bring the Spanish as well, but they couldn't make it. And we, one of our main questions was whether it would be possible to do a global history of Europe along the same lines. And uh, it was my suggestion, actually, and it was sort of rejected, I think, quite clearly with a, with a vast majority. So I, I did it. Well, I, I can see I can see other reasons. They basically said that, you know, if you don't have a clear sense of where the borders are, uh, then it doesn't make sense to think about, you know, what crosses the borders. <laughs> right. Uh, and that, that, of course, is a very good point. Right. And, 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 uh, and also for us coming from East Central Europe, our uh, problem might be this is what my co-editors also say that if you do a global history of that kind, you might end up in a very peripheral, very marginal position all over again, mm -hmm. because much of the global history of Europe will be actually a global history of Western Europe. And that's mm -hmm. not so advantageous. Mm -hmm. And I think we're, we're in a better position now than, than if, that was <laughs> that, if that was done in that way, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you so much. Who would also like to jump in with a question? Yes, yeah. okay. Alexa. Can I have a, just a quick question following about what you said about the borders of Europe. Like the borders of Hungary have shifted a lot like, yeah. did that play did you have to that fact yes absolutely so if you look at the uh the, the green the green volume the newer one so that was one of the big questions like, what do we put on the cover mm -hmm. right because of course with the modern and contemporary it was very obvious you put on the the, the cover the the, the 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 map of the country and the map of the world behind it and with these points to show the how they are intertwined Right, and there was no question about it. But here, it was a serious question. I, I told them, look, guys, you can't put Greater Hungary on the cover. It would be such a bad idea. But of course, they said, well, but we also ca ca we cannot not put it yeah. on the cover for all those reasons, right? Because then, then we would get the critique that we're, you know, past falsifying and so on. And so basically what we did was we put on the map of Greater Hungary and then the Ottoman Times with the division of the country into the different parts, right? And you see both of them simultaneously on the cover. Yeah. So that's the that was one of the very tricky things. But but more generally, I would say our whole approach is to say that borders don't matter nearly as much as you think, right? That actually borders are much more, right? In the 20th century, especially I think in Soviet times, we came to think of borders as absolutely decisive. But for so many reasons, they're actually much less important than you think. And that's what this book tries to show. So in fact, in fact, it wasn't it wasn't so important. And we don't even really have a chapter on it, which we actually might have done. So we might have had a chapter about the the global history of borders, but mm -hmm. that's what we didn't do. Yes, Marco. Um, I have a couple of questions, and you know, this is such a powerhouse, <laughs> like intellectual powerhouse that you have co-created, and I'm very impressed. It's very erudite, and uh, you know, methodologically refined. So, yeah, I also uh, share Chris' uh, desire to uh, do it immediately, but <laughs> just imagine. <laughs> who would be responsible? Warsaw or Krakow or you know, for, uh -huh. for the editing of the Polish uh, well, it's a joke, of course, because I mean these these are I think Warsaw. Of course it's a joke because it's Warsaw. It's <laughs> actually closer to some colleagues in Budapest than in, in Vienna than to colleagues in Krakow because it's really uh, sometimes uh, anyway. What I wanted to say is that um ask you about references to other dates that that are in uh, at the end of each chapter can you explain what it is so this is one short question mm -hmm. because it, it seems like you are making these references mm -hmm. to other chapters and i want to ask about this you know references inside the logic of references in um in the book another question is about historiography i i want to know more about your how you organized teamwork was it did you was it conceived as an opportunity to learn from other specialists in the field it was and you had some kind of trans epochal you know uh, conversations um or did you just um ordered um you know you, you spoke so in a bilateral way with with, with specialists in each uh, field uh, representing some specific uh, subject. So the, I would like to know more about the map of the world. And 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 the last question is about this um, some methods and assumptions that Hong 
you know, that did not sort of semi deconstruct <laughs> because this is this works through the whole project seems to be in its spirits like semi deconstruction, right? Mm -hmm. Deconstructivist per periphery, right? Central periphery, such a you know, Hungarian specialist, the Lagunzon economy, right? <laughs> coming from Hungary. And I myself uh, don't apply central periphery framework in my own work. Uh, as Eastern, Eastern Europeanist, and I have some arguments for it, and uh, it's also debatable uh, why actually, you know, uh, but I wanted to know whether there are any kind of haunting figures of Hungarian historiography, since much of the references are Hungarian. Not all, of course, but many. Whether there are any kind of haunting figures of uh, from Hungary related historiography that uh, that uh, marked the project in positive or Negative way. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. There are lots of questions. Uh, let me start with a simple one. I didn't deal with the cross references at all. <laughs> to be honest, I'm not entirely sure uh, how they turned out. Uh, we had a very clear division in the team uh, in many ways. Uh, one of us was, I, I won't be very concrete because it's, it's being recorded, right? So one of <laughs> us was responsible for all the organization in terms of emailing and uploading to the Google Drive and what have you. Uh, one of us edited all the texts uh, thoroughly in terms of language and whether you know the, the comma is where the comma should be and, yeah. and all of that. that that was me i can say that and there was a fact checker who who checked everything things like if there's a 17th century uh, hungarian writing in german about persia and he transcribes a persian word like that is that a good transcription today and was it a good transcription in the 17th century now there's probably two people in hungary who would be able to answer the question we have to track them down maybe there's one and then they might disagree with each other if there's two right but okay so we had those things so that was that was uh, also an extremely difficult task i should also say that the organizational part was the most difficult and okay, it's being reported, but I say it anyway. So Barney Marga did all of that, so he definitely <laughs> deserves the most credit for it because he, he he carried the heaviest burden. But of course, the organization was such that we were always on a, a messaging site of a famous company, which I won't mention by name, <laughs> and we were announcing each other every five minutes. And you know, my phone, I opened it up, and it always said, "Send a message to Barney Marga," because we sent like thousands and thousands and thousands, and maybe more than ten thousand messages just related to Volume One. Because there was always some issue, some problem, something to communicate, and so. And of course, we did it in our free time because uh, we didn't have any funding for it. So it was more or less evenings and, and other things like that, weekends. But of course, we really, we really loved it. So it, we did it because we were passionate about it and, and we really enjoyed it. Uh, uh, but uh, we really kind of believed in it in a certain sense, if you if you want. So that's the. But about the teamwork, I would say um, certain people struggled uh, with uh, figuring out how they should do it. And they asked for examples. So we always had to think about what do we share with whom and why, and whether we share like sort of a sort of a, a bundle of articles. And of course, the, the, the sections had to make sense, right? So when we have, let's say, let's take again the, the clearest example, perhaps the economic crises. There we of course wanted to cross-reference them and show some of the, you know, so there, you know, people who write about 2008-9 and the consequences, they, they will have. They will have had to read uh, 1873 and what have you, and they did, and and then they, then we discussed and so. But but those things, for example, the economic history part worked out very easily because economic historians think in this way already anyway, right? So for them, this was not so such a big novelty at all. Uh, now, uh, so 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 there there were a lot of. Uh, well, what we also struggled with a bit is that, of course, a lot of authors had opinions about how to do it and and what to include and, and so on and so forth. And there we had to say, no, no, we have an overarching concept. We have the proportions <laughs> in mind. We figured this out one way or another. If you did it, you would probably do it very differently. And that we get from a lot of people that you know, if they had to pick 203 chapters, they would maybe you know throw out half of what we have in there and put in something else, and that's perfectly fine. That's perfectly fine. You know, that's absolutely not uh, uh, for me. It's 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 very good. This shows the potential of this project. Like the, the Dutch, by the way, they just did another volume where they say not mayor, like even more. <laughs> yeah, and and well, we won't we won't do because we'll be very exhausted by it. But 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 we could, and and so so that's the thing about the concept. Well, yes. Um, I mean, I, I often say exactly so the, the economic historians uh, uh, have uh, shaped this discourse about periphery, semi periphery, and so on, Wallerstein, Bear, and Ranke, and so. And we use that language for a number of the chapters, but we also insist 
that this language doesn't apply um, generally to the history as such. For example, for intellectual and cultural history, it doesn't really make sense to use those terms, and, and we actually don't. Uh, and and that is a, that is also very interesting because the, the one chapter in the in the green volume, in the new one, that we I have to say struggled with the most was precisely on this topic, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the rise of capitalism. Uh, the 16th century and the so-called economic peripheralization, because there are very different narratives, and there's a huge uh, clash, <laughs> in the, so to say, between the paradigms, and we didn't quite know how to deal with that. Right? Some consider the the critical approach very uh, old-fashioned, Marxist, and outdated. Others think that the new approach is a lot worse, <laughs> and so on. And, and it, th that is the one chapter I think we rewrote 15, 20 times, and and we struggled with it a lot. Uh, and and I can tell you more about that later. But but I have to say, if I think of one inspiration, and it's very interesting in a way, it actually would be on Serb somehow because we have a chapter on the Via Gerdom the history of world literature, one of the most famous and most loved books in Hungarian, like ever, I would say, published originally in 1941. And the chapter on it shows, which is Esther Palfi, a literary historian from Page, she shows basically how. There is a European canon and a global canon of literature, and how there is a there, how there are kind of waves uh, in 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 the in the in the canonization of non-European literature in Europe, and how Hungary very often follows that trend with a certain delay, mm -hmm. right? So if there's a great interest in Chinese literature uh, in Germany, then you would have a uh, you know translations uh, via Goethe and what have you and so on, uh, also also in in Hungary. And basically, what we thought, what what, what Palfi was describing uh, in her chapter about the history of, of the history of the right, writing of literary history, if that makes sense, what she was describing there is actually very very similar with what is happening today and what we are doing. Right? We're also taking a Western European model because the Western Europeans have opened uh, towards the globe, have opened towards the rest of the world, are writing these kind of books, and we, as you know, people from from this country, we are doing the same uh, with a delay of just a few years. So actually, actually, that was for us a kind of eye opener. That in fact, she's describing us <laughs> in, the, in the book. Just a very quick follow up. That this, I think, this is an understatement that you just there is some sort of time lag and you are emulating. Of course, there is a lot of unique uh, methodology that you do apply here. It seems like being between different worlds makes you more, uh, or you know prone to st structural thinking like you are more aware self-aware of structures big structures and i and i wonder if that's i think this whole book seems to be very much shaped by self self-awareness of structures yes i think i think you're right i mean I, i'd like to say you know we have uh, uh basically taken the template and we have adopted it right i, I sort of I try to insist on on, on both also in, during the talk because obviously uh, this book, if you open it, even if you don't speak a word of Hungarian, you will notice immediately that it's like a French book and, and everything is basically structured in the same way and so on. And they should have put copyright on it, but they didn't and so on. <laughs> but uh, but uh, so that's the one part of it. The, the, the other part is that is that we have, of course, really thought about what does it mean to, to use this kind of very strange French template, which is, again, essentially about France in the world, and you know there are many conventions of writing about that, right? The French Revolution, the fashion, and you know all the big things where France has uh, the meter, and, and so. Uh, uh, and of course, we don't have that, right? So of course, our story is very, very different, and we need it to adopt. So yes, we, in a way, we, in a way, we go beyond it, but also we're part of this massive wave, right? There are ten books by now. There might be more in the near future. It's it's been a success, by the way, everywhere, as far as I know, with probably the single exception of Germany, mm -hmm. which is also very interesting. They titled it um, Deutschland Global Geschichte einer Nation, so so uh, <laughs> Germany, the global history of a nation, yeah. and they wanted to appeal with this more what we might call cosmopolitan perspective to the to the kind of nationally oriented crowd, you know, with this. You know, well, uh, you, you know what's going on in Germany today. So they wanted to say, and this was somehow they fell in between the, the cracks because the, the left liberal and so people didn't care because it was too sounded too, too Deutschland and so. And people who were like, you know, Deutsch and national. And so they thought it was it was not their thing either. Right. So there somehow it didn't work in France. It worked incredibly well. You may know they sold, I think, 130,000 copies very quickly, not least because 
in the presidential election campaign of Macron, it was a bone of contention in 2017, right? Macron promoted the book, the Figaro and many of the other also Zemmour attacked it in like open, like, you know, front page uh, columns. And so, so it was a massive thing. And it makes a lot of sense, right? Because in France, uh, there is exactly a, a kind of polarization there. I also think that for the same reason, this would be a very good book to do in the US, by the way, but that's, that's uh, for, for, for others to think about. Yes. Um, I, uh, so I've only read the second volume, the first volume, but I was wondering, uh, you talk about the concept of political nation versus ethnic nation. Um, and then obviously, you know, you're not, there's no chapter about like, you know, Stuhl, Kola, you know, Slovakia, for example, just as, you know, leaving outside of Romania. I mean, why is that? Obviously, there's limitations of space, time, money, colleagues, fine people in Slovakia. Also, I'm assuming, you know, I'm mean, literally colonized, bring, take back, gravity, but um, I was just wondering sort of how you had to put that conceptually because in a way, because there's not engagement with certain parts of greater Hungary, it ends up becoming a Magyar-centric story in some respects. I don't, know, I don't know, how did you, how did you manage that? <laughs> yes, you, you, you're, you're pointing to the, to the thing that he grants the most, uh, obviously. This is a very, very good point. And we got the, the, the criticism once before from a Croatian a colleague. And this, of course, is very true, right? Of course, we don't modernize the story in the sense that it's not like there are many people from India and many people from Argentina, all sorts of, you know, people and, and, and anybody can, you know, there are Muslim Hungarians and there are Buddhist Hungarians and, and so on and so forth. That's, all of that is, is clear. We struggled quite a bit precisely, as you're saying, you know, with what to do about the Slovaks and the Croatians and the Romanians and so on, right? And they are probably underrepresented for the exact same reason, right? And that, of course, it's, and then, of course, it's also, if you, if you want to express the same thing through socioeconomic categories, it's the urban populations that are overrepresented. There are, of course, plenty of Germans and there are plenty of Jews in these volumes, uh, almost, almost unavoidably, right? And, and so on. And of course, we don't have clear uh, criteria or, you know, whatever percentages, and one should never try, I think, in that way. But, but, but the point is that, that we didn't watch. There are, quite, there are quite some chapters on the Romanians and the Romanian story in the first volume. We didn't want to have, and this was also actually not my own um, uh, decision in the first place, but we didn't want to have so much on the Romanian uh, irredenta, even though we could have had it. Uh, uh, but we said we also want to have chapters and chapter subjects which will be original, which will be really new to most of our readers. And so much has been written on the Romanian Irredenta in, in Transylvania and so on. And there's so many books about that, that we thought, well, we could do another chapter, but then what, right? And I have to say, and this is again a bit behind the scenes, I really, really regret that we don't have the Stur uh, chapter and the Slovak national movement, because, you know, of course, Kosut was uh, part of his family was also Slovak and, 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 so, and all the rest of it. And we have a brilliant historian, precisely of my age, who's done, I think, one of the best biographies of Stur in Hungarian being translated and so, but he didn't, uh, again, I shouldn't be saying too, too many, but he didn't contribute in the end. And well, we have we had to we had to do with what we what we got. And again, I have to also add that I think ninety seven percent of the people uh, ended up delivering. So we had very very good luck in this respect. Most people delivered, and most people, the very large majority, delivered on time, <laughs> which is also interesting. Uh, everybody was, I think, almost everybody we contacted was enthusiastic enough, and and it was a, it was a small and creative task, right? This is a kind of chapter you can write in a day or two if you know your own research, and we ask people to write about their own research in a new way, in a new through a new framing. Mm -hmm. So we basically almost you know 15th of September first volume we had almost the entire book on our on our computer from one day to the next. Of course, we had to work on it uh, for many 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 months. But that's one of the biggest. That's one, of, and you know, if if you do another one, a multi-ethnic Hungary, uh, uh, in that way to also include, you know, the the so-called nationalities in the nineteenth century, so that would I think be quite a different book as well. Uh, but of course, you also always wanted to look at the earliest transnational connection, right? So it biases the story, uh, like so much of history is biased in a certain way, right? If you think of who was the first. A Hungarian who went to uh, today's Pakistan and painted uh, the the royal court in Lahore uh, and and which is still displayed in the National Museum of, pa of Pakistan and that's August Schöpft and Schöpft was of course the German Hungarian right <laughs> yeah. yes I was curious if you could talk is come up obviously in, in your discussion about this as a multi-author 
volume to the extreme, right? You have many, many authors. So could you imagine a version of this that would be a single author or a dual author? And, and how would it be different? So what's gained from having it to be a large project besides the speed, obviously, <laughs> versus having it more of a single authorial vision? Do you, maybe you can contrast the, the values of that polyphony versus maybe the disadvantages. Uh, it's very interesting you ask that. So one of my co-editors, and I always try not to mention names, and then I always end up doing that. Right? So one of my co-editors said- We can edit that out. Yes. <laughs> He's like, cut yeah, this is not automatic cut yeah. <laughs> So, so uh, the, the thing is that uh, one of my co-editors really insisted that we could have done it in the end on our own, and it wouldn't have been more difficult. And so I don't, I, personally, I don't agree there. You know, we, we, we're very close friends. We, we work friends. Here, we really disagree. I think most of this we couldn't have done because we simply don't have the, the detailed knowledge. And in fact, for me personally, this was such an interesting project because honestly, 70% of what's in these books I didn't know before. I mean, I, I have to be completely honest. I mean, what did I know about, you know, do, do you know that the first Buddhist community in Hungary was founded during the short few years of Stalinism? I mean, who on earth would have thought about it, right? There was, a, strangely enough, in East Germany, they recognized the Buddhists in like around 1950 and within a few years in Hungary too. And then it's, a, okay, so these kind of things, I mean, unless you're really working at, uh, you know, some something like, Buddhist history of East Central Europe or whatever, you, you would never, you would, and, and that's, that's true for many, many, many things. So my sense is that in 20, 30 years, maybe this will be possible, right? Like the way that Oskar Hamel in Germany wrote, you know, global history of the 19th century on his own, uh, right? In Germany, this is of course very often the, 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 the idea that one author writes like a thousand pages or what have you. Uh, well, we don't have the, the labor force for that on, <laughs> on our own, let's put it a bit. But, but also, uh, also this, is, uh, this is, I think, on the, on the current level, this is the way we, the way we basically are gathered. So the big surprise was, and, and this I, I, I'll, I again uh, I'll say from, so that you understand uh, the context. When we started out, uh, my very first uh, email said, we should do a small sample of this kind. We should show to people what this is like, what's the point of it, and we should, and we would be able to collect 15 or 20 texts. <laughs> this was my first email, you know, and of course we saved it and so on. And out of that basic idea of just having a, a you know, tiny sample of the most obvious things from this transnational global perspective, we ended up with these two books in a few years because the research is already there. But it was completely scattered, right? You have dozens and dozens of really good researchers, also mostly young people, doing all this work in various places. And basically, what we needed was to bring it together. But not even I, who initiated the whole thing, was aware that this research was quite there to this extent. So I think the volume turned the volumes turned out to be a lot more substantial and a lot better than I than I had anticipated. But I would have never dared, you know, try write it. I mean, now we have, of course, the whole problem with other languages, right? Because nobody will translate a thousand pages about Hungarian history into any other language because who on earth needs so much stuff, right? But uh, but of course, uh, in English, if we need two hundred pages, we might want to write it uh, the three of us. Mm -hmm. And then there's always the moral dilemma of what do you do when you actually draw on other people's research all the time, right? Yeah. It's of course like a, like a, it happens in projects a lot, but. Uh, and it's not it's not it's not fair right so it's it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a real dilemma how we would do it if we if we ended up uh, with that which is more likely than anything else i would say because of the financial and other constraints any other questions yes so i'm i'm an amateur historian of hungarian descent and thank you for all of your great work um, I'm working on a personal history of my Hungarian grandmother, so I'm very interested, actually, I hadn't thought about the context of Hungarian feminism. I've been looking at how she went to the U.S., the role of American feminism, mm -hmm. which became such a traditional culture and changed her life here. Mm -hmm. um, are there, and I also was flipping through looking at the beautiful photos, are there, maybe it's somewhere in Hungarian that maybe not yet know how to read, is there resources you recommend in terms of original photographic archives or you know, and maybe, maybe I will translate the feminist chapter and send it to you or whatever. <laughs> so we have two chapters on, on the feminist uh, st uh, stories because we also have one on the communists, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then the communist alliance after the Second World War. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have one on the more recent. We have, the, we have a chapter on the LGBT uh, movement and the first pride in, in Budapest in the late 90s and how they were connected to people in Cologne, in Köln, mm -hmm. and things like that. But... Um, and of course, New York, because of course, this is where the first one was. 
but uh, uh, we used a lot the Fortepan uh, archive for all that word. For, That's the name of an archive. Yes. Okay. So it's online, it's freely available, okay. and it has amazing amount of historical yeah. photography. And we took most of the pictures from there. Uh, that's really the best thing you can do. Um, okay. Yeah, she left Hungary in 39. And so it was, yeah. it was an interesting, like, I come from a more personal lens yeah. that yeah. there were three sisters, and the first one had an arranged marriage. Mm -hmm. She yeah. got to choose who she married, but it would yes. have to be in a certain cultural context. And yes. the third sister went off the rails, so to speak. Yeah. So it's just interesting that she, you know, that this conflict was the year before she was born. Yes. So it opened my eyes of like, oh, these were the social forces yes. around the family from that point of view. There is a lot of very good research, uh, I, sh I should add maybe, on the history of feminism these days. Actually, the CU Press is publishing, I think, six or 700 pages of the major oh. documents oh. of the history of feminism and, and so on. Oh. This year, I believe, it's like four, four yeah. co-editors, and I, I happen to know most of them. Oh. It's, it should be coming out this year. So, so maybe check that because that will be, I think, a resource that was never there before. Yeah, I happened to find this online last night at 11.30, so <laughs> glad to get this. Um, great, great. Thanks. All right, thank you so much, Tarantz. If ever there was another good reason to learn Hungarian. <laughs> <laughs>